said I'm assaulting the compound and they told me not to. So I'd rather die here now than f live the rest of my life in regret. Breached the door and then suicide bombers started running at us and just cracking their cells off. And, and I thought that was it for me that day. Like, so I'm going to die doing this. You got blown up in 24 hours twice. Yeah. I initially thought I was the one that stood in the ID and I've never been so f scared in my life, mate. First firefight you get into, you just don't expect it to be like it is. And when rounds are ringing past your head, you can hear them zipping past you and you're only 18 years old, you're like, Help. How's your mind when you come back to the UK? When you're so hyper vigilant, when you do things like that, you can remember every detail. Could I have done this and save this person? Could I have done that and save this person? And before you know it, you're asking yourself a million questions. Your head can't take all that information in. You can't process it all. And then one day it just got too much for me. I put a, put a thing up in a loft and stepped out and bang, hung myself. And when they got to me, I was just hanging there, no life. Radis, welcome to the show, mate. Yeah, good, good to be here, mate. It took a while to get here, didn't it? It did. It did. It's taken a few months, but we're here. Yeah. And very much looking forward to this one. Yeah, same, mate. Same. Yeah, mate. Let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you get into the Special Forces? Uh, so I was part of Special Forces support group. Um, so I started in a place called Burford in the Cotswolds. That's where I was essentially brought up until I was nine years old. Um, then my dad was a bit of a scrapper, a bit of a boy. Um, and mum made a move, move away from where all the trouble was. Yeah. So we moved literally five miles away. <laughs> so we could carry on. Yeah. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, so we moved to a place called Bampton, which is just it's literally about two miles from Bryce Norton. I always say I live in Bryce Norton. Really. And where's Bryce Norton? Is that Oxfordshire? Yeah. Okay. That's where the big airfield is that we use as um, essentially like a, a launching place to go on operations, yeah. Yeah. which was ideal for me being in, being in the military. Yeah. Um, what was school life like for you? What were you like as a kid at school? I got bullied all the way through school. Yeah, um, I was smaller than everyone else. Um, got into rugby about nine years old. My dad wanted to like you know get me into something physical. I wasn't really a physical person as a kid. Um, I was kind of a, sh a shy, smaller guy um, that got picked on. Um, my dad always said he's not going to get involved. He's not going to you know do anything. It's, it's down to me to sort it out. Um, and I kind of hated him for that. Didn't like, I didn't like that. I always thought my dad would, you know, stick up for me, do something here. Um, every day getting bullied at school. And then that's where the military come in. I always wanted to go, go into the military from, from a younger, young age. And everyone said I'm, I'd fail it. No one, no one said I'd pass, especially parachute regiment. You know, it's hardest yeah. regiment to get into apart from special forces. Um, a lot of Royal Marines would argue that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. Of course they would, of course they would. What age was it when you, when um, you, when you set on that journey? Straight from school. Straight from school, 16 yeah. 16 or 18? 16. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Dad, I actually went to join the RAF fire service to start with because Dad didn't want me to join the parachute regiment. Um, he basically said we're a load of thugs and fucking idiots because they're predominantly the ones he used to fight all the time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what was your old man do then? Um, he was a fireman okay. for 15 years. And then he, he left that and he still got his own haulage company. So he's just a lorry driver. Yeah. Um, does well out of it. He's happy doing that. But he's just... Yeah, he's a bit of a boy back in the day. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> tell me, tell me when you grow up. You said bullying. What kind of bullying was it? Physical, emotional. Um, obviously, I wanted to go in the military, and people obviously knew that. So I used to talk about it in the army. Uh, sorry, at school, saying I'm going to go in the military. Um, I can actually remember doing a talk on the parachute regiment when I was God, must have been about 11 years old, and the guy that bullied me punched me straight in the face at lunchtime and said, "You'll never make it." And that kind of always stuck me that, mm. you know, as that was my drive and people don't believe in me, but I believe I can do this. Yeah. Um, and if I'm honest with you, dad's friends didn't believe me that I'd pass it. Did that, did that motivate you even more knowing that people didn't believe in you going, well, what's your space? Yeah. 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 My dad believed in me. Mm. My dad always said I'd pass. Um, you probably see that fire in me to that drive to get there. Um, and it took me a bit longer than expected. Um, I think at week 12 in, in the parachute regiment selection, I fractured my hip, running down a hill with all my backpack on. You know, when you kind of try and slow yourself down, yeah. you jolt your hips mm. to try and slow yourself down and that weight on the back kind of jolted my hip and I felt something go and it fractured my hip. So I went into rehab for, God, I think it was about eight months. So it took me about a year and a half, just under two years to get, get through training. Wow. But um, I stuck with it. And what was that training like? Horrible. Yeah. Give me an example. Of, um, give me an example. When you left school at 16, 
you don't just go straight into parachute regiment, right? Yeah. You then you go straight into it, do you? Yeah, you go straight into parachute regiment. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so you have to get yourself to a fitness standard to go into in there. You can't just go in um, unfit. Yeah. But you don't want to go in too fit. If you go in too fit, they basically build you up to the fitness level they want you to be at. If you go in too fit, you want to lose fitness because you're going to start running like two miles. Yeah. If you go in running, you've been doing ten miles as a, as a you know before you go in, you also lose fitness. Yeah. Um, and I was kind of at the right right stage. I used to go running with one of my um, my dad's mates. We used to do about eight miles every couple of nights. Um, and that was horrible in itself as a as a sixteen year old kid. I was like, I fucking hate yeah. this. <laughs> what, am going the, this. <laughs> what am I going in the army for? I don't like this. <laughs> um, but it's strange because all the things that the paras do, I don't like. Yeah, I don't like running. Yeah. I'm scared of heights. So, <laughs> I think it was more of a look at what I can do, yeah. proving to people what I can I can be something, and proving to people I can actually get into one of the hardest regiments in the in the yeah. British Army, and I. It kind of just spammed from there, and I only, I think some of some of, some of me doubted myself, but there's partly where I was like, I need to do this yeah. to prove to people I am something, and also to prove to my dad that I am that person that I want to, you know, he wants me to be. And what was that? What was it like for your mindset? Knowing you've gone in there, you've gone running, done your hip, and you had to recover for eighteen months to get back to full fitness. That was an, um, yeah, that was quite. It was. It wasn't. It's just a setback, wasn't it? But the, the corporals are there to help you out at the end of the day. They want you to pass. They're not. They're not there to to make you fail. And I had a good support support network around me. There, they um they helped me out quite a lot. The corporals, um, they were sound. Um, I'm actually good friends with one of them now called Scott, mm. uh, John Scott. He um he he pushed me a lot in, in training. I actually handed my letter five times to say I want to leave. <laughs> After how long? This was in like. God, the first 12 weeks. So the I first 12 weeks of going into Paris, you were like, I'm out of this. Can't I can't do this. It. Like running right? every day, getting thrashed every day, getting woken up at four o'clock in the morning and made to do press-ups until you can't do any more press-ups. You get you in a line and they make you do press-ups. So it's like one, 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 one. And you go down the line and it's two, two, two. And if someone fucks up and goes, gets a number wrong, you're... it's like, right, start again. Oh, mate. And you can get to five and they go, where do we start, Joe? And you're like, because of course, Joe's joined an enlistment. Yeah. Um, and it's zero, so you have to like start again. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> what was the What was it like having a, like a, a group of lads all training together day to day? Yeah, it was alright. It wasn't. It, w- it wasn't what you'd think it would be, mm. would be. You'd expect there to be a lot of testosterone, a lot of because there's a lot of you know guys that want to go to parachute. Yeah. They've all got something about them in, in certain levels. Um, not everybody, but there's some tasty people that are, mm. you know go into the paras. You thought there'd be a few. Um, you know, a few dramas, a few issues, but it's not. Everyone's there to help each other out and work as a team. And you essentially get graded on that as well. So it's not just graded on fitness levels and what they can see in you as, and can you actually make it to be a paratrooper? It's about the teamwork effort as well. Mm. You know, can you, um, can you work as a team and can you, can you pull your, your brothers through it when the shit gets hard? Yeah. Because when you go on operations, shit does get hard mm. and you need your mates to pull you through sometimes. And how long did it take you to actually pass to get into the paras? Just under two years. Okay. Yeah. And um, I actually wanted to go to two paras because that's where my mates were going. So I was, as I was going through, I was also making friends and they're passing out before me. And that was quite hard in itself, seeing people pass out before me who were my friends and then get actually into the paras. And I was still stuck in training. Um, and they were going on operations and, you know, doing things and I wanted to go to two para because that's where my mates were when he said you're going one para I was like for fuck's sake <laughs> what have you got to do to get into two para nothing it's just where they choose you choose okay. choose yeah so everyone thinks that one two and three para are like one para is the best two para is second you know second yeah. best three para is at the bottom it's not they're all the same the only thing that is different now is one para special force support group so they're directly linked to SAS SBS and SRR which is a SRR special reconnaissance regiment so they're like um, they work with like SIS, MI five, MI six. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. And, and when and, and was there a first time? How old were you when you first went on tour? Um, eighteen. So I'd, my first tour, I passed out of training. Went to one para. I was there for a couple of weeks, and I went to Northern Ireland, um, which was actually nothing going on there really. Yeah. What year um, roughly were we talking there? This is two thousand five. 2005, okay. Yeah, so there was nothing going on there, really. Um, just nice and chilled. 
the only thing that happened to me was a kid was at the bottom of an alleyway with a Black Widow catapult. And he was shooting marbles at me, and I, was, I thought he ain't gonna fucking hit me. He's about, <laughs> about, he's about, he's about fucking 100 meters away, and he caught me straight in the shin. Did he? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I tell you what, I fucking hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Split my shin as well. <laughs> Rubber bullet. <laughs> I was like, no, you, you, like back then, it was like, don't do anything. Cause, yeah. don't, because it was the last tour. It was the la very last Northern yeah. Iron tour, closing down then. Wow. And while we was out there, they were taking down the towers, like dismantling them. Right. So if we fired around, it's like one the powers and one, one power kicked off again because one power is obviously linked to Bloody Sunday. Yeah. Um, and it would just kick it all off again. So it was like, so you had to take for it fuck's sake, just <laughs> don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you when you come back from Ireland, was what was the next tour? What was the movement for you? Did you have to stay back in camp for a while and then go right? You're flying out here. No, this is this is where it gets a bit um, bit spicy. So while I was out on that tour, SFSG hadn't actually started yet, but there's talks of it kicking off. So they get S? SFSG, Special Forces Support Group. Okay. So there's talks about it kicking off. Yeah. One power at this time was still part of 16 Air Assault, so we had no real role outside of the parachute regiment. Was, um, we we're just normal infantry parachute battalion. And then two months before the end of the Northern Ireland tour, we started doing pre-deployment training in Northern Ireland to go to Iraq. Right. So I literally had all my training in Northern Ireland, like fast roping, getting onto target. So it's like the rope out the back of a helicopter. Yeah. Um, what we do when we get on target, um, bit of compound clearance, um, different weapon handling drills, um, and then different using different radios, different body armor, um, MVGs. And then we literally deployed. I had like a month off and I went to Iraq for six wow. months. So literally one tour straight to the other. And what was that feeling like, knowing you're going to a somewhere that's been quite calm, and you said it's quite boring to go, and, right, I'm going to Iraq? Well, I didn't really know what to expect, really, because you never know what to expect. You can always you can always try and build just build up a certain image in your head to what it's going to be like, but it's nothing like you expect it to be. Um, the first contact, the first firefight you get into, that's when your ass starts to go, because you just don't expect it to be like it is. And when rounds are winging past your head, you can hear them zipping past you, and you're only 18 years old, you're like, fucking hell. This isn't what I expected it to be like. Yeah. What was that like, though? Where were you kipping? What was the movement like in the day? What would you have to do in the day? Do you have to do certain shifts? How did no, it work? so we had a lot. So it's actually quite a good tour in that respect. So daytime, we'd go to uh, Saddam's Palace and go in the swimming pool and chill out. <laughs> in Saddam's uh, is those palace? of palaces, yeah. Is so, right? so, like, yeah, so we literally go to What, a big like, pink inflatable Cadillac oh, type thing? Yeah, so like, it was like being on holiday. Like, <laughs> yeah, go to the PX and get like Oakley sunglasses. <laughs> just blow all your like, blow your month's wages <laughs> on Oakley sunglasses. Burger King, Subway. <laughs> <laughs> get a Starbucks. <laughs> just, quality. Um, just buy some DVDs because there's like the dodgy man with DVDs yeah. and just get like a DVD set you can watch in your, in your daytime. Then you go on the ranges, do some shooting skills, a um, bit like extra training, med training, whatever. And then you get the brief for the night time up, whatever up we're going on. And that was it. We, we was away at night and we get the call, have another hour um, like brief on what the op is going to be and who's doing what part in the op so everyone knows what's going on, where the helicopter's going to land, what's going to happen, who we're going after, a bit about the target, a bit about his cell, like what he's about and what his cell's about. About his cell? Like his, um, so the, 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 the group of terrorists, the, yeah. the terrorist cell that he's part of, whichever um, cell he's part of, or if he's ISIS or whatever. And then we go out and get them. What, literally straight in a helicopter, bang? bang yeah, or we get in vehicles and drive to them. Depends on how far away they are. Because I, I was in Baghdad at the time. Um, so we had to wear like American uniform uh, back then, dressed as Americans, because it was their like area of operations, their AO. So we didn't want to stand out as Brits in, a, in an American area. So we had to wear their uniform and drive in their, their Humvees. Wow, what's the difference between American uniform and British uniform? It's a lot better. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> apart from the badge, yeah. the, the British badge is better, isn't it? We actually used to wear American <laughs> patches, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, some of us used to wear American patches. and But yeah, the, the kit's um, the kit's better, but it's, ours has got better throughout the, you know, throughout the time of mm. the war on, global war on terror, if you like. How do you know who's a terrorist and who's not a terrorist? You don't really. Okay. There's ways of telling as time goes on and you get more experience in theatre or said theatre, like in Afghanistan, if you see a guy wearing trainers, they don't wear trainers in Afghan, they wear flip-flops. Yeah. But if someone's wearing trainers, you're like, he wants to move fast, he can't move fast in flip-flops. 
So he's obviously wearing trainers for a reason. What's that reason? Take a bit of better look at the geezer and you know you can figure out little things about him and see if he is a terrorist or not. Or you know sometimes they try and blend in. They're far at you, throw their weapons down and walk amongst other people. So it's just got to be you know have your wits about you. Mm. So what is there a rule in the army where you are not allowed to fire? Yeah. So it's card alpha. Um, you can only shoot. So it's basically if like if someone's shooting at me and they got a weapon point, you know, all, all the lads and they got a weapon pointed at us, we can take them out. If they were to shoot us and put that weapon down, we can't shoot them. And who's going to know? No one. Yeah. Come up with a story between your mates after, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, he, he, he dropped it. He dropped yeah. it. Yeah. No, but then, um, but then in Afghanistan there was um, I can't remember what the, what the card what it changed to. I think it was four one nine alpha card four one nine alpha. I think it was, which if somebody's likely to commit an act to endanger life, that you can take a take a shot. So if if someone's digging an ID in the ground, and you see him putting an ID in the ground. Um, that's an act likely to endanger life, so you can take him out. Yeah. Um, if someone's walking around with a weapon or ICOM, you know, talking into the ICOM, like, yeah. you know what ICOM is, right? No. So ICOM's uh, what they communicate between. So the, the Taliban will communicate with the radios, and we call it ICOM. Yeah. We can actually tap into that and listen to what they're saying. So they start coming up with all sorts of code words, like um, IDs would be watermelons. So get yeah. the watermelons up. Yeah. Um, and that's where the intelligence comes in from, mm. you know, um, certain individuals. But yeah, if someone's putting an ID in the ground and walking around with a weapon, you can take him out. Um, there's actually a guy in Afghan who was putting a what I thought was an ID in the ground. Um, it's outside curfew hours. I was going to put an ambush in with my um, Afghan team, and um, I th- he was digging a hole in the ground, so he had a lantern next to him. So I took a shot and hit him twice in the back, and walked up to him. And what he's trying to do is trying to get water to go across the road to his to his cattle. Oh man. So it's, sometimes you get it wrong, yeah. But um, you can you can't really. So you, you went over. What did you say to him? No, I think he was dead. He was dead. Right. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't say anything. But his family came out and his family started kicking off. Um, but yeah, it's, it's outside curfew hours. Digging a, you know, what I thought was an ID in the ground. You know, they walk around with lanterns as well, so it all added up. And wow. I'm not going to go down there and try and, you know, shout at him if he's putting an ID in the ground and. Mm. No, of just, course you're, you're it, doing your job. Interesting, yeah. said. Well, I shot him in the shot him in the back twice. Actually, go over yeah. there. And it's just brown it's just bread, water, and his it? family are kicking off. What's the next movements for that? If someone's family's kicking well, off. Well, the reason I walked down there was because I was I had my Afghans with me, so I wanted to get the ID out the ground because you're never going to leave the ID in the ground. It'd just be used against us again at some point. Um, so it's a case of like just cutting the cables, taking it back, and you also hand it over for forensics. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I went down there, and there was no no ID, but it's just. Just war, isn't it? And how did that make you feel? D- it didn't bother me when I was out there. It's when you come back, you can't really think about it out there. Yeah. And to be honest, because you're, you're hitting targets all the time, you're killing people quite quite often, you kind of dis- disconnect yourself from reality and you're not really in a good headspace out there. You're, you're almost evil in some sense. You're not... I wasn't the person my mum thinks I am out there. Yeah. But very different, very different. Um... But when you come back and you're back into reality as such, then and things, you know, and that's when it gets hard. Yeah. You know, when your missus trying to show you love and yeah. I want to kiss or something, you laugh. Like, oh, you know, yeah. I don't want that. You're brushing it all away and you you push people away from you because and then you slowly get back into it. But it's like um anxiety. Yeah. I never knew what anxiety was back then. I just thought it was just butterflies in my belly, but no one tells you what you're gonna feel when you get home. Mm. No one wants to talk about it. We all feel something, but no one goes back to work and said, right, I feel something here. You know, I'm starting to feel a bit weird. We saw crack on, just get on with it. And if you said something like that, the boys would like, sort yourself out. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Just out of sight, out of mind, mate. Just so kind of how long it. were you in that first operation? Um, so my first, my first Northern Ireland tour was four months, yeah. three or four months. Then um, six months for my Iraq tour. Then I come back from the Iraq tour is what we've just been speaking about there. Yeah. So you're there for six months. Yeah. If you were to summarise that six months, well, how would you explain it? Um, it was alright actually. I see my first um, dead body on that tour, so I actually posted it on my Instagram the other day. Mm. Uh, you might have seen it with Alz Kawi. So yeah. Alz Kawi was the founder of ISIS. He um, he he was the founder of ISIS. He was like a, a Bin Laden of Iraq. Um, there's a series of operations with joint with the, the Americans and us going after him in his, his little terrorist cell. So we got information on him one night um, in this 
in this house. So we flew out to it. And as we flew out there, yeah, it just kicked off. And the first assault team, so the first assault team SAS guys go, go forward, put charge on the door and get wiped out. They get shot. So that's five guys shot now. What a lot. Yeah, five British guys, yeah, at the door. So dragging them back. So my team got sent forward to, to drag them back and get them out of there as the reserve, reserve team um, supporting the SAS. And then suicide bombers started running at us and just cracking themselves off. And I can remember looking at this geezer and it, the only way I can describe it is magic. He's like there one minute and he's fucking disappeared. Crazy. Um, and at 18, that's quite a fucking lot to... That's a lot to take on board an 18-year-old kid. Process, yeah. Because you're not 18. It doesn't matter what anyone says. You're not a man 18. Just yet, but you've been jumped straight into the deep end, here. Yeah. yeah. But it also comes down to a lot of things what I've learned in this, in this life now is We've all got a learning history, and our learning history is what we think, feel, and that the way we act. Yeah. And we're always taking all the information we take on in life, you know, from our parents and the closest people around us, is how we act later on in life and how we feel later on in life. And we don't realize that. And even at 18, you're still absorbing information because you're still a kid, mate. Yeah, I agree. So when trouble, you know, when you get troubled later on in life, that's why, because you're still a kid fighting a war. Yeah. You're seeing things you shouldn't really see at that age. Yeah. I mean, Look at the, how the geezers felt back in World War Two at fucking sixteen years yeah, old, mate. Crazy, right? Mental. In that six months, was there certain periods where it was just full on, or was there certain periods where there was a lot of downtime as well? It's full on. Was it night time? Yeah. So we'd bounce from one. Sometimes we'd hit one house, and then white lads were hitting another house. Was that exciting hit. for you? Yeah. The SES actually told us to calm down on that tour because <laughs> we're getting so many firefights. Okay. Um, and how many how many groups of lads were around you? You knew that they had your back. All of them, mate. Every single one. Every one of them. How yeah. many? Roughly. So on on that tour, there's probably thirty of us, thirty five of us. Yeah. So we all have um, <clears throat> we're all in different teams, and our job out there was to do the cordons for the SES. So when when two two go in and do their strike on the on said house or said target, we put a perimeter around the house so nobody can get in and nobody can get out. Say there's a squirter, as in a runner from the house. Um, a squirter yeah so someone runs away from the house yeah okay um, helicopter or aeroplane in the sky is going to yeah. tell us that someone's running away and we're intercept them or if someone's trying to get in say the target his mates are trying to get in to rescue him we keep him away or, or we take him out yeah what's the first instinct when you see a squirter do you think right I've got to take him out yeah it's rugby tackle him or, or okay. shoot him okay what did you prefer Good old rugby tackle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I'd roll, yeah. <laughs> Fully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then anyone who's trying to come onto that scene is exactly the same again. Yes, mate. Yeah, but you but must have the fear in there. Okay, you're a massive, massive man. You'll take most people out in a tear up. And I've heard your reputation is, is out there as well. Yeah. Surely you'd have the fear that they're carrying. Yeah, well, this is, um, this is where a lot of experience comes into it also because you've got suicide bombers. Yeah. You've got the potential that he's got a weapon on him. But then also, with the respect to people coming into the cordon, are they just being nosy? Yeah. Um, I mean, years ago, there was a, there was like, the, um, I think he was deaf and dumb. There's no polite way of putting it. Just deaf and dumb, um, walking around and lads started firing some shots at him. You always give a warning shot. If you're unsure, if you're unsure on something, just fire a shot next to him, hits the ground next to him, they see the splash of the weapon, of the, of the, of the bullet, sorry, and it flies off and then they're like, fucking hell, I need to get away from here. Yeah. Next one's going to be, you know, in my chest. So yeah. they, they disappear quite sharpish, but this geezer wasn't moving. Um, and yeah, and then someone said, you know, some Iraqi came out and said he, he's deaf and dumb. So we're like, oh, fucking hell, it's a good job we didn't shoot him then, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, so you got to you have your wits about you. you got to weigh things up sometimes you do get it wrong sometimes pe t people do get killed in war and yeah. it's the wrong you know it's the wrong person but what prime example is the guy doing the water underneath yeah but the that's thing, war yeah. mate and yeah. if you had everything up in your head and you truly believe that that guy's gonna kill me or that guy's gonna kill somebody then in your heart you know you're doing the right thing yeah. and you can't change that because yeah. you strongly you believe he is gonna kill somebody or yeah. kill one of my friends what was your mentality as 35 men got each other's backs in the paratroopers at the ages you were at what was the mentality of of every single one of you if you were to sum it up all a bit you know a bit loose yeah um yeah the, the reputation of paras anyway were all a bit loose um pissheads thugs but it couldn't be um further from the truth really <clears throat> i mean we all like a tear up we all like to fight each other 
if we have a problem, like you know, the old school way. Mm. But um, but we're very intelligent soldiers, mate. Yeah. Very intelligent soldiers, and we're you know that's why we've got the reputation of being one of the best units in the in the world, in the world essentially. Yeah, I agree. Um, because we train, we we get obsessed. We become pros in our field. To be a pro in something, you have to get obsessed with it. Yeah. And you have to have that thing has to be more important than anything in your life. I mean, yeah. when I was married, my wife always knew that she was second best. The Paris are always before her. Mm. She knew that in our relationship. She knew I was married to the Paris, not her. Yeah. Um, you still with her? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we get on to that it's later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, <clears throat> tell me. So those six months seems like it was proper full on. What did you do to decompress before you come home? So this is the other, this is the other thing, mate. Like because um, SOSG was. What did you new, say that SOSG? Special Forces Support Group. Yes, yeah, Group. SFSG. S -S yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like a new unit. No one really knew what to do with us. Okay. Essentially, so we we're going on these ops and coming back, and we we're just being thrown straight, you know, straight at home. Yeah. There's no decompression, as in like stopping off in Cyprus, like um, some units are doing for two days and having decompression. Yeah. But we get onto that because I got you know. There's something I want to say about yeah. the decompression and the whole. Actually, I'll say about it now. Yeah. So with a decompression, you do a tour for six months and you're you're killing people. You're seeing your mates get blown up, and you're fighting a fierce enemy. You're going through a lot. So they put you in Cyprus for two weeks, uh, for two days, and they give you beer, and they give you like a, a comedian. Now, no one laughs at the comedian. No one wants to watch the band. Yeah. All you do is you drink beer and you fight each other. So you're basically doing what you've just done for six months with beer added. <laughs> with your mates. Yeah. So you, when you get back to the UK, you're like, ah, oh, fucking. That's life. Yeah, I had decompression. Yeah, okay. So you go down town and a lot like me, um, I was just trying to chase that thrill of having a fight. and Because yeah. <clears throat> you come, it's what you want. You want to fight a tenor all the time. You want to get amongst it. You want to. How did you feel coming back though? Because you're a scrapper. You grew up the old man of scrapper, which you're a hard man. You've been fighting as a power against the enemy. You're then yeah. coming back, getting on the smash, and then going out partying and carrying on fighting because it's just in the blood. Well, the problem comes when, because you know, if you're if you're a big lad, then like I was as a kid when I got bullied, and people knew that I got bullied at, at school, but I become a big lad when I was in the army. Um, People always wanted to have a pop, mate, because they knew that I got bullied at school. Yeah. I'd become a big lad. I was in the army. So they'd have a pop. Now, I had that mentality of, I'm good to go. Yeah. This is what I want. This is what I've been looking for. And you're yeah. giving it to me. Yeah. But then you come out on top and, you know, get locked up and have a free, a free night on Her Majesty's, a, yeah. the Queen in a, in a prison cell mm -hmm. for, a, for a night. And yeah, but then... It's a funny old world because my dad started having a go at me about it. My dad started saying, like, you're a fucking idiot and you need to sort your life out. And he said, you'll end up like me and throw your career away. But I didn't see it like that. I just wanted to keep keep scrapping, mate, essentially. Yeah. And that was, that's kind of what was keeping my demons at bay, was scrapping. Because I was keeping myself in that, that mentality. Did of, you feel like you're keeping yourself at the top of the game? Because yeah. Because you've got to go back to another <clears throat> tour. Yeah. Mm. And the thing is with Special Force Support Group, you can go back at any time. So we do a rotation of six months on operations, six months on character terrorism, which is working with like the police in the UK doing character terrorism stuff. Um, you know, like the um, Manchester bombing yeah. that happened, that kind of stuff. Um, and you do six months on standby, which you can go anywhere in the world. Like um, it'll be like a Sudan style thing, you know, like extracting Britons from a, a war-torn country, so yeah. essentially or something that happens. Um, so you can go away at any time. There's no... There's no like you're going away in six months. Sometimes it's yeah. it's a page you're going off, and you're like, yeah. Fuck, "I'm going away in about an hour." Yeah. And when you come back, are you back with your wife or your your, your ex-wife? Were you back with your missus living, or you are you on yeah. camp? Yeah. So me and my missus at a at a um, at a house just outside of camp. Um, I was actually with all the sergeant majors, and so <laughs> so the house which um, which I'm supposed to get, they were shit, mm. and I knew there's better houses at the sergeant majors than everyone gets. <laughs> So I told him I had a dog because I knew there's high fences over that side of camp yeah. where all the good houses are. So I said I got a dog in it, jumped the fences on the crap side. <laughs> to get the nice house. So they put me in with all the sergeant majors. Like, How yeah. the fuck have you got a house over yeah, here? Yeah. He said, because I've got a dog. Quality. They were like, where is your dog? I ain't got one. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like? How did your missus deal with you? How does a partner deal with someone who's wanting to scrap and is at it and is 
testosterone as high as you can get. It's hard for her. And I um, I see that massively now. I didn't see it at the time. Um, but she'd be like, I want to go out. Like, just me and you. I'm like, nah, going out with the boys. Yeah. Like, going out with a lot of the lads. Or I get home from work one day and I'm like, I've invited all the lads around for a barbecue. And then they come around the house, mate, with a crate of beer each. And they put it up against the door, stack it up against the door, and they're like, we ain't leaving until all that beer's oh, drunk. <laughs> and she's like, oh, for fuck's yeah, sake. Like, and it's one of them where she had to just... Come second. Yeah, but she had to also just accept that that was life. Yeah. And I mean, it's hard for her in the sense as well where sometimes I've got a phone up. I'll, I'll be on camp one day, something's happening. I'll phone her and say, look, I might not be coming home tonight. You know, something's going on. And she's like, well, what's happening? Like, I can't tell you. Where are you going? Can't tell you. How long are you going for? Can't tell you. Yeah. And that's hard in itself for, you know, she loved me. Mm. I'm sure she still does because we've got kids together and, you know, there's different styles of love, isn't there? There's being in love with someone and there's loving somebody, isn't there? Yeah. So I'm sort of, you know, I love her. I'm not in love with her, but I still love her. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's been hard for her, even when we split up, because she see the person I, you know, she married. I got so far away from that person and I just become a different person the more and more I got into that career. How long were you in the paratroopers for? And how long were you married with her for? So I married, I married, I met Sinead in 2010, early 2010. Married her in 2014 and we got divorced last year. Okay. So she's had all those years of seeing you just be, yeah. he's a different bloke to when I first met him. Yeah. And did you find that you were getting worse and worse? Yeah. <clears throat> so she, um, so she, she was the one that noticed what was wrong with me. She said, like, like the, the phrase she uses, lights are on, but no one's home. Okay. She'd see me just staring into dead space and fly off the handle like that. You know, just things started happening and she'd just see that I'd become a very different person. I'd look at the telly, but like I'd be watching the telly, but she knew I wasn't watching the telly. Yeah. I was just staring at it. I wasn't taking any information in. Um, yeah, so she said to me, you need to go and see her. Your medical officer. So I went to see the medical officer and he said, right, you go to see the quack. Um, so I went to the quack, went through the process and he said, oh, you're just angry. I went, oh, mega, that's what I need to be to be a paratrooper. I need to be angry to go to Afghan. Mm. I can't be, I can't be like all happy and, yeah. you know, buzzing when I'm going to Afghan. So I, yeah, it's sound. So I went back to her and said, um, I've seen the quack. He said, I'm angry. I've got anger issues. That's it. So they're going to, you know, they're going to talk to me for a couple of weeks. So we went through the process of talking to her for a couple of weeks and she said, I ain't fucking happy with that answer. Yeah. So she went to see my medical officer then and said, I ain't happy with that answer. There's something wrong with him. Mm. Um, but then they, they done nothing. Got brushed under the carpet and kept sending me away. And she just had to live with that and just live with the fact that that was it. There's nothing she could do. Mm. Must be hard for her. Yeah. But the other thing as well is she knew guys that were getting wounded. She knew guys that were getting killed. You were coming back. You were coming back. Yeah. yeah. Tell me your next tour. So I want, I'm interested in that, but you said the counter-terrorism. So you're flying back after something. You could go and work with the British police and the uh, CI5 and etc. MI5, so, yeah. MI5, sorry, yeah. and working with those guys. What would you be doing with them? So it's, it's, it's planning for worst case scenarios more than anything. There's not so many operations going that you think as in like taking terrorists out or anything, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, so like airplane options, assault and airplanes, um, uh, trains, um, underground on the underground, London underground. So we get like a a plat platform for a day, um, and run through, you know, what would happen if somebody took a took a, a tube. Yeah. Um, what would happen if somebody took a an airplane? It's just going through the process and keeping on top of those skill sets. Yeah, okay. We need to keep on top of the skill sets to, you know, you can't just go through an airplane option once. You need to keep doing it until you know, keep just keep practicing mm. did you find yourself got bored when you were back here and you wanted to get back out to another tour yeah you always wanted to get back yeah. out what was your next tour what was your next big tour so my next tour after um what was it after that one so that would have, it would have been kosovo and what year was this roughly 2008 okay so that was to go out there with srr which is a special reconnaissance regiment yeah um yeah that's going out there so i was doing ops um what's op Observation posts. Okay. So it's getting inside a bush, living inside a bush, gathering information, getting in a building, um, like spying on people basically. Um, so we're spying on a target for for them to um, 
for them to essentially snatch and grab at some point. And what was Kosovo like compared to Iraq? It's all right out there, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Spent most of that lashed up. Um. <laughs> 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 There's a theme going on here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we go into an OP, like an observation post. Yeah. We spend lots of time in it, which is hard graft because you're eating your food cold. Um, you can't get a cooker on. Yeah. There's, you know, smoke coming out the top really hot, yeah. you know, bush. Yeah. So you have to eat everything cold, you know, pissing bottles, shit in bags, and yeah. you like good stuff. And then you come back and just get on the lash. Mm. Well, back in camp? Yeah, come back to camp and get on the lash, yeah. No. Good and, what, and, and how long were you, how long were you out there for? Eight weeks on that tour. Okay. And then that one there, you came back, and how long were you back in England for? Um, About two months. And then off to where? Then back to Iraq. And what was that feeling, knowing you're going back to what you experienced before to turn it into the person you become at the age of 18? It's actually awesome to go back to Iraq again. Um, so while I was actually in the UK, my little sister's living next door to Bryce. My little sister's got friends, or my whole family's got friends that are in the RAF. And my little sister's friend's dad got killed in, in Iraq on the camp I was going to. Um, he was in a shower and a mortar round came in and landed you know, where he was over the shower and, and killed him. And my job was out there was to be assault team one. So we're the first assault team. So we we're going to go into the house first on, on the assault. So we, ste we actually stepped away from what we we're doing in the last Iraq tour on the cordons. We were actually going to be assaulting the buildings as assault team one. Um, and I was gonna be the first person in the house on every op. Um, and I knew I was gonna go and take that guy out at some point, the guy, because we we're going to take out the IDF teams, indirect fire teams, like mortar teams. Yeah. And that was our job, like to basically- And you had that in the back of your mind about- Yeah, was, okay. and we did actually get him. Yeah, we got the guy out. Not the guy that fired it, but the guy that was like the head of the, yeah. the, the mortar cell. And you when like. you say you got him, to give me the, give me an explanation, tell me how you got him. So he's actually quite switched on. He was actually um, like renting people's rooms and bouncing around. So when we first got out to um, Iraq on this tour, they weren't, they knew we were coming for him. Um, and they were fighting back in the houses. So we um, so we killed quite a few of them. Um, we took a few of them out and then we obviously have like um, agents. So uh, they're Iraqis that come and give us information and we pay them for information um, or Afghanis. And then there was rumors going around in their cell that there's a British hunter fo like killer force that were out to you know kill them. Yeah. So this guy started bouncing around people's houses and and hiding from us. Um, and then one day we just found found out where he was, like MI five. I think it was MI six actually. Um, she said she's got him, so we went out and we went into the room, and there he was with a weapon in the corner of the room, and we got him before he got us. We've got the upper hand because we've got night vision goggles. Night vision, I was going to say. So it always gives us the, mm. the upper hand. What's that feeling like wearing night vision goggles? Do you feel like you've got a superpower? Do you know, it's strange because when you're on operations, yeah. you you can work better on night vision goggles than you can off them. Right, okay. Because you constantly work, you don't work in daytime. Yeah. You only work at night. And because you're only working at night, you obviously have to wear night vision goggles mm. and you start to get a headache from them. So it's because um, it's green. And so give me, give me an example once you've got them on. What's that? What's it like? So the way I used to wear mine, so back then we used to have ones that kind of come in, um, like twin ones. Um, but as I used, as I went on, I used to wear mine kind of like here, so I can kind of I can kind of dip my head a little bit and look over. So if I look over, I can I'm actually looking through my night vision. But if I tilt my head back like this, I'm looking under them. Yeah, okay. So I don't have to keep putting my hands up and moving my night vision goggles up and down. You can kind of have them set in between your eyes, so you can tilt your head and you're looking through and you take a shot. Or you're looking underneath them because depending on if you go into a room and it's pitch dark, then you need that night vision goggles. Yeah. But if you go into a room and it's light, I don't want to take my hand off the weapon and flip them up. Yeah. I'll just look underneath them and keep them on. So when you're doing a mission like this, what are you wearing? What are you carrying? Um, What's everything on your body? What sort of extra weight is it? It's actually like so the, on this one in, in Iraq, it's actually light scales because we go out, and just hit a house, and we're straight back out. You know, we're not we're not messing around on target. We're going to stay on target to gather the information we need or get intelligence from that target, but we're not hanging around. So I take my magazines, um, a few bottles of water, um, stun grenades, four stun grenades. Four stun grenades? Yeah, so flashbangs. They're just like six bangers. You throw them into a, deep into a room. 
make six loud bangs, six loud flashes, distraction. Yeah. And yeah. And um, come in handy then. Then I thermal barrack grenade. Oh, which one? Thermal barrack. Which is? Um, if you throw it into a house, it basically cuts the house. Yeah, it's quite a powerful wow. grenade. It's about that big. So you throw it into a house, it'll collapse the house. Um, be quite good to be fair. We throw... <laughs> it's quite an handy one to have, or, isn't it? <laughs> or if you, throw, if you throw it into a room and someone's in the room, it'll turn their, just turn their insides to jelly. Yeah, okay. Or just turn them inside out, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah it's a good one to have. Yeah. Have you used one of them before? No, unfortunately no. not. No. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew it was in the locker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else do you have on you? And it's to be fair, it's quite a scary team because you think if I, if I pulled a pin by accident, I'm off skis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so we actually, um, funny story about that. So we, we we just hit the house on this op, and we we're making our way back to the HLS to get picked up, and we've got the geezer that we're after. And he's blindfolded and plastic cuffed, and we've taken him back and. We're there waiting for helis to come in, and one of the lads is taking his weapon off. But as he's taking his weapon off, he's caught a pin on the flashbang <gasps> on the stone grenade. It's gone, poof, she's on a kit, and it's gone bang. And the skis, obviously, just you know, in his house, he's gone, What the fuck's that out of there? So he's opened the door to see what's going on. And I've never seen so many red dots on a geezer. <laughs> Everyone's just gone bang with their red dots. He's like, Fuck, fuck. <laughs> just ran back inside. <laughs> <laughs> and what weapon have you got? What, what are you carrying? Uh, C8 DeMarco, which is um, a Canadian variant of like the M4. Yeah, it's, um, you can put a long barrel on it. So when we went to Afghanistan, we had a longer barrel. Obviously, because of a longer barrel, you can shoot further. What sort um, of distance? That'll go to 600, 800 metres. Meters. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, so that's a long barrel we use um, out in Afghanistan, but you've got a shorter barrel for room clearance. So like a counter-terrorism place, you know, things like that. When you're fighting in a building, you don't want a long barrel because it'll catch on walls and just turns into pain in the arse. Mm -hmm. You don't really need to shoot far taking shots quite close, a lot of meter away sometimes. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, in a room, it's not fire, is it? Mm. You're shooting somebody at, what, 10 meters sometimes. Mm. Um, so you just go short barrel. You're able to maneuver around the round barrel. And was it, was it a success? How long were you in that, on that third tour? So you've gone Ireland, sorry, you've got a fourth tour, in fact, you've gone Ireland, you've gone Iraq, you've gone Kosovo, and now you're back to Iraq again. Yeah. How long were you there on that time? So that's six months. So actually on that tour, it was the safest ever Iraq tour. So we reduced the threat to the COB, which is the uh, main uh, camp for the British forces. Um, we reduced it by 90%. Right, okay. So it was the safest ever tour in Iraq because we were going out every night and smashing targets. Yeah. And sometimes we are doing like three a night. What, by car, by helicopter, whatever? Both, both, yeah. What, whatever we needed to, to go in. And what was the biggest buzz for you? Being first man through the door, you never know what's you never know what's behind the door. And you're cool with that. Yeah, sometimes you're like <laughs> like this guy's a suicide bomber, like, you know, potentially got suicide. So there's another I'll tell you another story. So yeah. um, so we're on target one day, and then you know potential suicide bomber, you know all this shit going on. We're doing like a little wreck of the house, and it didn't really seem like much was going on. It was just strange ones. We're like, ah, fucking, the lights are on, but not much is going on. Like yeah. not much noise. Blow the charge on the on the gate mate and we run through get the door and kick the door in and go in and there's shit those people there's about 18 people mate it's a wedding oh you're joking mate <laughs> the geezer was after he just got married like it was yeah so there's a wedding party but we couldn't hear it outside the building but yeah when we got inside we like I just stood there in a fucking group of people in front of me I was like fucking took, you know, took me off guard a little bit so you have to start screaming at them like get on the fucking floor and putting guns in their face and they usually understand like if you if you use a few Fs, mate, and a you know, gun in their face, yeah. you usually get on the floor. Yeah, I would imagine so. So what was that feeling like in terms of, okay, you've gone in there and gone, I'm actually in a not a dangerous place right now. They're actually having a wedding with family and kids and wives. And well, it's actually, How do you react? It's actually worse because you're taken off guard because there's so many people there, but then you, do, you can't keep your eyes on everybody. You can't look at everybody. And then have they got a suicide vest on? Is someone carrying? So it's a case of get them all on the floor like ASAP. And tie them up? Yeah tie everybody up, blindfold everybody, split the men up from the women and children, split them all up. You always split them up. You would put women and children in one room, men in the other, split the men up. And then you start interrogating them for further information so you can bounce onto another target. Wow. Yeah. And then you're still going in with 35 more banded on something like this? No. Or are they just smaller groups going on? So this one was, um, so there was six of us in the SALT Team 1 and then the other assault teams were actually Iraqi police. But we used to say, just stay outside the house, we'll crack on. Yeah. Like, we'll do this. Um, they weren't really that good, if I'm honest with you. 
Mm. So we just said, we're, we're take the house, we're assault it. So we, um, so six of us from Special Forces Support Group, um, two from 2-2-SAS, who were doing our demos for us. Um, and then there was like a side, squadron sergeant major and boss from 2-2-SAS, so essentially four, but just two in the first assault team. And then we did the Armageddon between doing our cordons for us, which were poachers, um, Royal Langlins. They were doing our cordons for us with American drivers. So Americans are driving the, um, the wagons for us. What's that feeling like when you're seeing that you've gone into a place like that and you're like, my God, this kid's involved here? Yeah, well, that's another one as well. You know, um, when kids are involved, it's a lot, a lot harder. When you go into a house and you take somebody out and then, you know, you walk into the room and someone's been killed and as you turn around and there's a fucking kid there. You know, that kid's just seen his dad get killed. You know, like a fucking mm. shocking mate, especially when the kid's screaming. Mm. Because this is where it becomes um, confusing emotionally when you get your emotions mixed up because you've got to be aggressive, you've got to be mean, you've got to be essentially more aggressive than them. When you hear the stories about the... Um, the, the, the terrorists beheading people. You've got to be more aggressive than that. If I go into a building and I'm met face to face with a terrorist, if you're a terrorist and I'm face to face with you, I've got to be more aggressive than you to put you on the back foot so you go, fucking hell, I've got to do as this guy says. If I match your aggression, he's going to think he's got an op he's got a chance against me. Mm -hmm. So he's not going to do as I, t as I tell him what. You've got to take a shot then, haven't you? Um, and you don't always want to take a shot. Now, because you look a menace as well, because you've got your kit on, you look a menace, you look mean, you got a weapon, you got your night vision goggles on. When you see a kid who's just watched his dad get killed and you're, you're aggressive, you've got to then try and come back down to to normal life, or if you like, mm. and try and calm this kid down and try and be nice to him. Get a glow stick like a Silum. They mean different things in our in our um in our world. But crack one and give it to him. Take a sweet out of your pocket, give it to him, sort him out take him to his mum or whatever, and then go back to being fucking evil again. Yeah. So you've just gone from the extreme down to being a kind, humane person mm. to going back to being fucking extreme again. Yeah. And it's confusing inside your head when you start sure doing is. that. And also you're going to take yourself off guard. Yeah. Because if you're going to go from being a lunatic, taking one-on-one -on -one with another fella, and then send a little kid there to try to drop down, that could put you off guard. And then the, yeah. Yeah, okay. And the... And the Another thing as well, when you're um, when you're so hyper vigilant, and you take in so much information, when you do things like that, you can remember every detail. So it's not a case of when something bad happens, you remember certain details. You remember every detail. So later on in life, when the demons start coming and the footsteps getting louder, so to speak, and demons start taking over your mind, you remember every detail, and it's fucking soul destroying, mate. Mm -hmm. and it rips you apart. Have you found that when you've come back from these tours, that fourth tour, that this the demon is, is, is building and building more and more in your head? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I That's kind of where soldiering clicked for me, if you like, in 2008, where, I mean, I, was no, I wasn't a good soldier up until that point, by no means. It's like any job, you've got to find your feet, haven't you? Um, and on that tour, I kind of found my feet as a soldier and, as an operator, as a door kicker. Um, and then, yeah, I, after that, so I had six months off. And then I went straight back to Afghan. So I did my Afghan tour then, um, 2009. So I actually had six months off. Probably two months of that were on leave. Why? Um, so I changed. So I'd, I volunteered to go out to Afghan. Um, loaded my mates from B Company. At this point, when I was in Iraq, I was in patrols platoon, which is um, recce platoon. So I wanted to go back to B Company because recce platoon was being disbanded. So I wanted to go back to B Company, which is my original platoon. Um, and that's what I got. I knew they were going to Afghan. That's what I wanted. Um, so yeah, I deployed to Afghan 2009. And that's where we lost six of our lads on that tour. One parent not lost anybody since like the 1980s. We've been very lucky, especially with all the operations we were doing um, with SF. And then... Yeah, 2009, we lost six lads. How is Afghan different to Iraq? Um, in Iraq, they're more shoot and scoop style shootings. 
they like shoot at you and then run away rather than stay and fight. Sometimes they stay and fight. That's usually ISIS um, that would stay and fight. Terror cells or, you know, the policeman just got a grudge against British force or whatever, yeah. just shoots and then runs away. So there's no actual like war fighting, if you like. It's not It's not having a proper scrap. It's just f- five-minute contact. Yeah. And it's out. And it's, then it's over. Afghan could be fucking fighting for days, mate. Could be fighting for hours, days. Got bombs, you could drop air. It's like it's war fighting. And you're going for exactly the same thing again. Yeah, but it's like on a bigger scale, mate. Mm. So, um, actually, and did you know that it was going to be on a bigger scale before you went to Afghan? I, d- I didn't expect it to be as bad as it was. I literally would. So um, all my tours, I used to get R&R because you get two weeks off yeah. in the six-month period. So I used to go out for for three months and then get two weeks off and then come back for three months. But what I was doing was I was getting all my money, saving up all my money for three months and blowing it on the two weeks off. And then yeah. I'd, I'd be like, where the fuck is all my money gone? Blown it on the lash. Yeah. So I said, right, I want to go on the first R and R on this tour. So went out to Afghan for two weeks, and then went back to the UK for two weeks, and then I had my whole tour to do, so I could save up loads of money then to buy a house with. But I got back to Afghan, and the Welsh guards at the time were taking a bit of a kick in in their area. So, um, so they asked me, do you want to do you want to fly out to the, and do Tiger teams? And the Tiger teams is where one of us commands an eight Afghan special forces team. So essentially, I was on my own with eight Afghans for six months, um, just to be attached to different units, going into areas that no one had ever been before. So you were by yourself with eight Afghans? Yeah, for six months, yeah. Out of choice? Yeah. So I, I was literally sat on the wagon still, just got back from UK. My sergeant major cut to me and went, Radis, do you want to go on the ground now? And I'm like, fucking right, yeah. And um, he said, right, go and pack your kit. You're going in three hours. You're going on tiger teams. And I was like, fucking mega. So we're on Tiger teams and just cut around like a fucking rock star in Afghan for six months. <laughs> with? With the Welsh guards, yeah. They, yeah. When I rocked up to um, so when I rocked up to the Welsh guards, they were like, who the fuck's this guy with a shotgun on his back? Because I had a shotgun for like door entry, yeah. my weapon and a pistol. They're like, who the fuck's this guy with a shotgun on his back? Just cutting around. <laughs> um, so, then, um, so then I went back. So every now and then you've got to go back to... Um, to, to camp to get a new Tiger team because you only you have them for a certain team. You don't have the same team all the time. You have different teams. And what are they doing? They're giving you intelligence? What, the Afghans? Yeah. No, they're fighting with you. They're fighting with you. Okay, yeah. but surely the, the British soldier's a lot better than an Afghan soldier. Yeah. Yeah, a lot better. How, why did you, did you feel safe with Afghan soldiers? Yeah, you yeah. You did, did you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. They were good mates. So we essentially train them up. We got our own ranges and things on the, on the camp, so we train these geezers up to be, you know, not to our standard, but to... Be some sta- high standard soldiers, yeah. you know, some sort of high standard. Um, and no, kind of know our tactics. So when we tell them to do something, when we're fighting, they know what our tactics are to a certain degree. Um, but I actually had a price in my head in that tour because my my tie team were causing the Taliban such a fucking headache. We're yeah. taking a lot of them out, um, and they fought as American special forces because of my kit. So they um, they put a price on my head and. They looked after me, mate. These Afghans didn't hand me over, didn't didn't shoot me, didn't turn on me. Looked after me, mate. Do you know what price it was? No. But you just I'll, knew I'll, that you had a price in your head to yeah. take you out. They they nicknamed me Obama. So every time I went up the camp, out of camp, they get on the icon and say Obama's out. Now I was only supposed to do two patrols a day, and that was going out with my tiger team. So I started doing four <laughs> to wind them up. Um, so I done two with the type my tiger team my Afghans, and I'd go up with the Welsh Guards as well. So I'd do an extra patrol. You just loved it, didn't you? Yeah, I fucking loved it, yeah. Yeah, that's all I lived for. Was, yeah. How old were you in 2009? Well, I've been then um, 23. Was I 23? I think I'd have been about 23, wouldn't I? Yeah, about that. Mm. 23, 24. Still young as well, isn't it? Yeah, I got blown up a few times on that tour as well. Um, you got blown up? Yeah, so... Cool. Um, so I actually got blown up twice in 24 hours, um, which is a bit tasty. Um, bit of a bit of a wake up call. Yeah. Um, you got blown up in 24 hours twice. Yeah. Tell me the first one. Um, so <clears throat> Louis Mandekale. Now there was supposed to be 20 IEDs in this village, and the, um, they wanted to open up this village back to the locals. You know, a bit of hearts and minds, get the village cleared of IEDs, and open it back up to locals. 
So, um, but they had to clear the IEDs out first. So we went on this operation to like basically keep the Taliban away and the engineers would go in and clear it out. Now we're going down this um, alleyway and start getting like pinged by the Taliban, start firing it. So get the lads into this compound and bear in mind, I didn't have a Valen, which is like, you know, the old metal detector that you find yeah. your IDs with. Yeah. All I had was my Mark 1 eyeballs to try and find like IEDs, mate. You just have to look out for like certain um, giveaways. Yeah. Um, what where someone's been dug, digging down or you can see something yeah or like where they piss on it like different colouring sand where they've dug a hole and then put the sand back on so it's wetter at the bottom yeah. you know little things like that or they yeah. put markers out like stone piles and things yeah. Um, so yeah get this compound deal with the firefight dealt with the firefight and then walk back out the door now we walk back out the door and I just get a fucking hit with all this deb debris like it just blows me back and it's I initially thought I was the one that stood on the ID and I've never been so fucking scared in my life mate yeah so I've done the old patting myself down, wiggling my toes. Oh, I've still got my legs. Yeah. Still got my hands. And I've looked at my face and like I'm out and there's like blood on my face. And um there's a picture of my helmet on on my Instagram where it's crushed one side of my helmet and there's a big fucking dent just just on the lip of it. So like one centimetre down, that whatever hit that would have gone I mean, good night. through yeah, through my head. Jeez. So then I had to regain control of my team. Um found my weapons, my weapon was blown away from me. Um and then find one of my Afghans, half in the hole, half, half out of it. He's um, he's cut in half, no arm, and then just a bit of this arm. And he's just mumbling. You know he's going to die. Um, and he died in that hole. But then you've got to regain control of your Afghans because your Afghans, obviously, you know, just one of their brothers, mate, yeah. essentially. So you've you got to try and deal with a firefight because the Taliban heard the bomb go off. They're firing at sort of PKM. You know what the sound of a PKM is because you, you get you know, shot all the time. So you, you know that distinctive sound mm -hmm. of the machine gun. Dealt with the firefight, called in fast air, got out there, took the body back. Now, in their religion, they have to bury the person within like 24 hours. So um, I'm trying to get my Afghans out of there, trying to help them out, um, but it's not happening. There's no helis coming in. So they're like, ah, fuck this, we're going. We're driving across the desert in our Ford Ranger pickup trucks with no armor. So I said, all right, I'll come with you and I'll pick up my new team. So I literally just covered my uniform with my patches, took my patches off. I just blended in like one of the Afghans sat in the back of the truck um, so we go across the desert get to Bastion hand over the team and the body and um, and get one new team come back but this time we're in an armoured vehicle we done exactly the same route I just took and got hit so I reckon they see us go whacked one in I whacked one yeah. in yeah Jesus so I said to the guys in the back of the truck I said I just got blown up like fucking like less than 24 hours ago fucking this is the second time and they're like what like and we get blown up in an armoured vehicle. What the arm, what, what, Feels what? like you go over a speed bump. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's a real big one. Um, it's got to be quite big to penetrate. You know, a Mastiff, which is a big old truck. So it weighs a lot. Mm. Um, but it's just like going over a speed bump, essentially. Just feel like a little lift. Yeah. But you know, because it's, it's a thud. It's not... When an ID goes off, it's not a bang. It's a thud. Mm. It's not a bang like an explosion like you think it would be. Yeah. It's just a big thud. Um, yeah, but I at the time I thought that was pretty, pretty decent. I was happy with that. <laughs> that you were alive. Yeah, yeah. No, I was happy. I got blown up twice. Yeah. before good story to tell the grandkids. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. And then, so tell me that tour there. Then, how long were you in there for? Six months. Six months again, and then back to England. But all this time, I can, I'm seeing, I'm noticing things. But come back to England, yeah. getting on the smash, yeah. fighting, getting into trouble, and then all you want to yeah. do is get back out again. But on that tour as well, something else happened on that tour where I got um, a gallantry award from um, for bravery on that on that tour. So um, let's not brush over that. You got a gallantry award. Yeah. Oh wow! Massive respect. Yeah. Um, so on that on that last tour we're talking about here. Yeah, 2009 one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got put forward for a Mitch Cross, but I got an MID, mentioned dispatches, uh, which is one below it. Um, so I got uh, three of my mates have been killed. They've been repatriated, and I went to um, back to the Welsh Guards. Um, before that even happened, two Pumas landed, and I said to my Afghans before these two Pumas landed, half go on one Puma, half go on the other. And what did they all do? All ran to the same Puma. So I went up to them and went, I said, no, you ones go to the other Puma. So they literally ran up the side of it and ducked under the tail rotor. And I was like, fucking hell. Like, I was just waiting for pink mist, yeah. mate. I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> and um, they managed to get under it all right. And I was like, fucking hell, that was close. And the load master's going mental. He's like, 
Anyway, we're flying in, and as we're flying in, the door gunner's giving it big licks, and so you know something's happening out there. Um, and we landed, um, went to the ops room, and there's a contact going on. One of the Welsh guards had lost his left leg. Um, now, you know when there's a firefight going on, they can't essentially deal with that, ty- uh, that, that, that um, casualty. You can't, they can't treat the casualty because they have to deal with the firefight first. Um, so I said, I'll put my Tiger team into a position where the Taliban starts to fight me, take it away from those guys, and they can deal with that casualty. And then essentially I'll be the one fighting the Taliban then. Yeah. And that's exactly what we've done. But I managed to just, by fluke, spot where the Taliban were, come out this cornfield, I could see them in a tree line. So I got my Afghans up and said, that's where the Taliban are, I fucking smash them. And they fired at the Taliban and didn't hit one of them. They all fucking ran, <laughs> ran into a compound. I was like, what the fuck? You've done it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So they ran into the compound now. I knew the next thing is there's going to be a heady coming in. And we've just taken rounds. The door gunner was giving it big licks. The what so was giving it big licks? The door gunner. Door gunner, okay. Yeah, yeah so the yeah. door gunner's firing out the door. <clears throat> so I know the next target's going to be that helicopter picking up that casualty. So I had to make a decision, which wasn't an easy one. That I'm going to assault that compound. And I thought that was it for me that day. Lights out. I'm going to die doing this. I actually did believe that's it. And um, so you, as you were going in, you're thinking, "This is the end for me." Yeah, but I couldn't not do anything. I thought if they take that helicopter out and that kid dies, he's lost his left leg. I can't look at myself for the rest of my life in the mirror. I won't be able to. I can't live with that. So I'd rather die here now than fucking live the rest of my life in regret. So I said I'm assaulting the compound. They told me not to. I said I'm doing it. Um, and tell them I'm going to put out booby traps and things, probably booby trap the door, put out IDs, stop us, you know, slow us down, get in there, or even stop us getting there. But I managed to get to the door and there's nothing there. And I thought, I fucking, I've made it to the door, like, it's all right. Um, so you got, by yourself at this point? No, I have my Afghans with me. The Afghans, so, okay. And that, that, the thing is, they're not, they're not trained like us yeah. to assault buildings. Um, but I had some confidence in myself because I'd just done it on the 2008 tour. I'd just been doing it every night for six months on the 2008 yeah. tour. So I had some confidence. Um, but anyway, I had an Afghan in front of me, breached the door. Now, the reason I put an Afghan in front of me is because if I get killed first man through the door, I can't command and control that team. Yeah. That team's going to go shit and they're probably going to die as well. So I need to have some someone in front of me to push through the door and get in there. Um, so I got in through the door and there's a telephone fighter stood right in front of me talking into a, into a radio and he shit himself. He didn't expect to see me there. Yeah. Um, so put two in his chest and... He was down straight out, walked over, put one through his head, um, and then proceeded to assault the compound. My Afghans were assaulting one side, and I was doing the other side of my own. Um, and I ended up killing another guy in that in that compound. So I got two kills in that compound. The Taliban killed some other guys. All together, there were seven killed in that compound. Um, and that was it. Fight over. Helicopter came in, picked the kid up, and took him away. Wow. I managed to put it off. Wow. I managed to live. Wow. Mate, that's some story. That's ballsy. Yeah. I got back to um back to the camp where the Welsh guards were and there was a grenadier guardsman and um well, I say guardsman, he was like um quite high ranking. Uh, he was um, I think he was a sergeant major. And he came over to me and was like, You could have got your fucking team killed. Yeah. You could have got you killed, yourself killed and I was taking off a kit at the time and um I ended up taking my t shirt off and we got parachute regiment tattoos, we all got tattoos, haven't we? And I said to him, uh, I said, Do you know why I didn't die anyway? Why is that? I went, Power edge. He got you fucking power edge all the same. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> like How was it for you? You're coming back for this. I'm listening to this story and I'm like blown away the stuff you're getting up to out there. And I thank you for your honesty as well. But how was your mind? You know, we're talking ten years in now, eight years, nine years. How's your mind when you come back to the UK? Do you know what? After the 2009 tour, that's when everyone see a massive change in me. That's yeah. when my mum knew. My mum. Um, so because we were losing some lads up there, my mum and dad knew some of the guys that were killed on that tour. So they were meeting up with a few of my mates on the, at the funerals and the lads were getting, um, they were getting told what I was up to on that on that tour. I mean, I got nine kills on that tour, just in that one six month period. Um, so they would, they would listen to, you know, hearing all the stories I was getting up to and and mum said she turned around to dad one day and said he ain't coming back. The day we know. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the day we know gone. Mm. And it was, it was, mate. Have yeah. you suffered? Massively. Massively, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of hard, that, you know, to, to say that, you know. 
So, yeah, it's a hard one. Especially when you, it's your parents, mate. Yeah. But, um... How, how have you personally suffered? So, um... I did another tour after that in 2011. Um, well, I was team leader again. Um, it was quite a tasty tour, um, just getting into fights. Never really stood out in that tour, to be honest. Um, I come back two months early off that tour because my dad was um, my dad was poorly, so I come back two months earlier off that tour. But never really stood out in that tour. And then um, I was just floating around doing little bits like counterterrorism and things. And then I got caught for steroids. I was getting ready to go back to Afghanistan in 2014 and I got pinged for steroids. Um, so they kicked me out of the army. Um, but I was suffering anyway when I was in the army. I just wanted to go scrapping all the time. I wanted to get back to Afghan. That's all I ever thought about was Afghan. That's all I ever cared about was getting back out to Afghan. When my mates died in 2009, I felt like there was still a piece of them out there. And that's the only place I wanted to be, mate. Just get back out there and get revenge. Um, because when you're killing an enemy, you become addicted to it. Because you disconnect yourself from reality. You become addicted to it. And I mean, people always say, you know, people that, that kill people don't talk about it. Bollocks, mate. You need to talk about it. Because some bits of it are cool when you're killing an enemy that killed your friends. And the ones that you get wrong, you can teach people about it. People can learn from your mistakes. So you, you do talk about it. You know, it's just bullshit when people say, oh, because he's, he's saying he's killed people, he hasn't done it. Bollocks. Um, but yeah, because you disconnect yourself from reality and you're not, you're not a fucking person, mate. You're essentially a robot just walking around. But if you've got mind health issues with everything going on and mixing with steroids, oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a horrible combination. Well the, well, the other thing as well is, I didn't realise that I had borderline personality disorder from getting bullied as a kid. Well, there's trauma there that hasn't been dealt with, I'd imagine. Yeah, so I only found this out. Yeah. 2016, I got diagnosed with that. So I had issues even when I was in the army, mate, but it was just being masked because I had issues, yeah. other issues going on. Yeah. It was just a cover-up. How have you suffered? When you got, when they said, what, well, you're out of the army because we found steroids, <laughs> how did you personally suffer after that? How did you feel? Well, I didn't really, look, all I ever wanted to do was be in the army. Um, and yeah, I hold my hands up, crime's getting caught, I got caught. Um, but at the same time, there should be like a duty of care there for somebody. Put it like, I went to the medical officer a few times and said, look, there's issues. My wife went to the medical officer and said, there's issues. Um, they noticed all the time that I was getting in trouble. Every time I was going on leave, I was going back and I'd been arrested at some point and everyone's okay. going to court cases with me quite a lot. And I was getting threatened with prison time and things. and. They knew something had snapped in my head. They knew something was had gone on. They can see my career. Peaking, great soldier. On ops, great soldier. Come back to UK. One of my officers even said, on ops, you're fucking awesome. Back in UK, you're a pain in our ass. Yeah. Why don't they do something about it? Why don't they like make you do something? I mean, yes, it would have been hard for me to go to counselling or something, or you know, but why don't they make me? Because in the army, you have to do stuff. If they yeah. tell you to do stuff, you have to do it. If I went through that process where they go, you're going to counselling, I might one day go, do you know what? This is actually making me feel a bit better. Yeah. There was none of that? No. Did no. you know you were becoming more loose every time you are coming back to the UK? If I'm honest with you, no, not really. Oh, okay. I knew something had changed in me, but I liked it. It's only when I left the army I knew something had gone seriously wrong. When I was in the army, it was a K card, a support network there, and everyone was exactly the same. Every person's the same. Everyone's got something wrong with them. So you essentially feel normal, if that makes sense. You feel normal in the army because everyone's the same. Yeah. Everyone's going through the same stuff. So you, it's only when I left the army and I stepped away from that that world, if you like, or the that camaraderie and brotherhood, did I realise that something's fucking seriously wrong. Yeah. You know, saying things in a pub and people look at you like, fucking hell. Yeah. Um, coming up with like dark jokes and people ain't laughing. You're yeah. the only one stood there laughing, mate. Yeah. Um, and then you just feel like an outsider, massively. And then things start creeping on, up on you because you're not talking about things so much. You keep your mouth quiet and you don't talk about things. So things start getting worse for you because you start having nightmares. You start getting paranoid about 
people not liking you. Um, just a lot of emotion, a lot, lot of emotion, mate. And then because you're not, you have nightmares and things, you can't sleep. And I used to, re patterns used to replay in my head. I used to call it like a snowball effect. I think about one thing. Could I have done this and save this person? Could I have done that and save this person? Did I really need to shoot that person? And before you know it, you're asking yourself a million questions and your head can't yeah. take all that information in. You can't process it all. So what I used to do, I used to punch myself, mate, to try and get it out of my head, to feel pain. So I'd make myself feel pain, it'd go away. Because I'm feeling pain, yeah. not the thoughts. And I'd fucking make myself black and blue, mate. I'd cut shit out of my face. I'd split my eyes and all sorts of my nose and broken my nose, cut my lips. Um, and then one day it just got too much for me. Um, mum and dad were away um, when well, they were out. Um, and I was texting them. Um, and the way they were texting, they knew something was wrong. And I hung myself in the in the loft. I put a put a thing up in the loft and stepped out and bang, hung myself. And when they got to me, I was just hanging there, no life. Literally nothing. Um, so dad climbed up the ladder into the loft and cut me down. I come down into my mum's arms and they'd done CPR and brought me back to life, mate. Hmm. Jeez. Yeah. So I'm lucky in that sense. And then, um, yeah, and that's when I knew. Because I had kids at that point as well, mate. How old are your kids? Um, then? Two. So I had two kids. Two, my two eldest are born three months apart, um, both the same age. I also knew something was wrong when they were born, and I felt nothing for them. I felt they were just a, a hinder, you know, they were hindering my life. They were a nuisance to me. I didn't want them. When I held them, I felt nothing. Um, and then just build up of emotion and things like that. And it just got too much for me and I hung myself, mate. I thought, that's it. I'm signing off. I need to get out of this life. It's just not for me. Fuck I can't. Hell, it is. I just thought I couldn't get out of this. But that's not it, mate. That's not even the end of it. A couple of weeks later, I put a knife straight in my stomach and pulled it out. And tried again. Tried a second time, but with a knife this time. I thought, I, I thought I can't get it from my chest. So I go through the stomach and put a knife straight in my stomach and... Who was noticing what was going on around here then? Everybody noticed that something was going on, but everybody was trying to help me, but... And this is where it goes back to, if the army made me do something, it might have worked, because they, you know... I had, I had respect for certain people in the army. If they made me do it, I'd have done it, and I might have felt something. But because I was out of the army and I was going to these... You know, people saying to me, go to counselling and things. I was going to counselling, but... I just didn't really feel anything, mate. So there was no support network whatsoever of you being told to leave the army? No. Nothing. You were told I, to leave the army? Mate, when they, from when they caught me taking steroids to leaving was two months. So right. did they actually catch you taking steroids? No, they see, drug tested me. So a piss test. So surely if they wanted to, can nothing like that get covered up to go, right, don't do that again, cover it up? Yeah, they or can. Or do you think they actually wanted you they, out? They actually do it now. So if someone gets caught taking cocaine yeah. in the army now, they give you a second chance. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think there was a part of them maybe wanting you out because a lot you were loose cannon? A lot of people have said this, and a lot of my mates said that they've they were tar they targeted you. Yeah. They wanted you out because they could see it. you would you'd start to become a a loose cannon. Like you're someone else's problem now. You're not the army's problem. Yeah. How old were you when you were asked to leave? Twenty. 28, 29. How many? How long was it after you left when you? Try to take your own life. I think it was about a year and a half. What was going on in your mind for those 18 months? Did you well, feel like you were just pushed out, forgotten about, yeah. worthless? The only, like, um, so only a few people caught, like, kept, kept in touch with me. My close mates, a lot of people, like, you know, because they're so busy, they're operational away all the time. Um, the hardest thing for me was, because I live next door to Bryce Norton, I watched my team go on a 2014 uh, lop. So I went, I basically waved all my mates goodbye that I'd just been training with for the last, God knows how many months. Yeah. The lads I'd been training in my team and they got a new team leader now, going back to Afghan. That was fucking soul destroying, mate. I wish I'd never done that, to be honest. Go and wave them off. Because it broke my fucking heart when I left. Um, yeah, and then I started doing security, stayed in that mindset, stayed in that like world, if you like, of security and going, Back to Iraq and places, done it on the ships for a little while, 
Um, yeah. And then I went to start going to the NHS. Now, the way I explain things to, about the NHS is the NHS treat the title, not a person. So if they say you've got post-traumatic stress disorder, they will treat the title, not the person. Now, if, you put a, if we've got 100 people in this room now, everybody that's got post-traumatic stress disorder or another mental health issue will be different in some way. Yeah. They're not all the same, mate. Um, so you need to treat the person, not the title. And when I was going back and seeing this guy for, God, I've seen him for about three months, I think. I went in there one day and he said, oh, so what have you been up to today? I said, I've been spending some time with my kids um, and family. He goes, oh, what are your kids' names? I thought, there's no fucking rapport here. Yeah. There's no, like, this is just a tick, tick box process. Yeah. And it pushed me away even more because I thought, no one fucking cares. But why am I even doing this? Why am I, why am I even coming to these counselling sessions? Like They don't care about me. So yeah. I just went back into a fucking, back to being a lunatic, just back to being in a dark place. Because I just thought, no one cares. Even the NHS that's supposed to help us out. I mean, don't get me wrong. Nurses in hospitals and A and E and things, yeah. yeah, granted. But I think mental health, they're very, they're behind on mental health. I think they could do more. On the day of you wanting to take your own life by hanging, how long have you planned that? For a long time, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it for a long time. How long? For months. I got to the stage where I just fucking have a meltdown. Like I said, I beat myself up, punched myself to fuck. I actually posted a picture of my face cut to, cut to pieces on um, Instagram just to to show this is what mental health is. It's not a fucking, it's not me stood there with my top off with my muscle showing. Mental health is sometimes you don't look pretty because you struggle and you punch yourself in the face because you can't get rid of thoughts in your head. So you want to feel something else rather than thoughts. You want to feel pain. And that's what mental health is. And sometimes you don't want to be in this world. And I know people say <clears throat> that suicide is selfish, etc. But I don't think it is because I wasn't me. Someone had taken over my body and my mind and I wasn't myself. I wasn't thinking straight. I wasn't who everyone thought I was. I was just someone had overtaken my body where that's what I thought was best. And I honestly thought everyone's going to be better off without me. I'll be in a better place. And fuck this, I'm going. So anyone out there listening who's got that thought price, what advice have you got for them? That life does get better. You're not the only one thinking that, and it does get better, and I'm proof of that. Positive change is possible, and I'm proof of that. I mean, I'm in, in a very good place now. Um, I had to find the right help and stick with it. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you're going to go through some hard conversations. You're going to be told the rights and wrongs of life. You're not going to want to hear everything the council has got to say, but um, you got to stick with it. And if you stick with it, you will find that you will start to change, and and it is positive change. Wow. I had to stick with it. I found it hard. I got told the rights and wrongs in life. I didn't like hearing some of the stuff that was you know I was being told. From what didn't you like being? What didn't you like hearing? That I was basically being a fucking idiot. You just um, didn't want to hear that. Yeah. Did you know you were being an idiot? Um, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I mean, when I was when I talk about I was chasing that thrill yeah. of war fighting thrill, I was, it's a, it wasn't essentially war fighting thrill that I was chasing. It's adrenaline yeah. that I was chasing. So I was even just, like cheating on my wife. I mean, both my kid, my oldest kids, born like, born three months apart. So I was two women pregnant at the same time. I was married to my wife. Um, I was cheating on my wife, you know. I was, you, I was just chasing anything I could to get a buzz. Anything to, to get away from the pain that hasn't. Made... I mean, I was. Mm. In the, you know, when I was in the army, I was dead against drugs. Yeah. When I left the army, I was cheating on my wife. I was fighting, taking drugs, drinking, taking steroids. The whole fucking mix. It's just recipe for carnage, mate, and disaster. And a twenty stone big bodybuilder, big I, lump. Man I just couldn't well. see it. Wow. I just couldn't see it. And the <clears> worst <throat> thing is, because I was in a bad place mm. mentally, when I was taking cocaine, yeah. I felt on top of the fucking world. Which I thought was the best thing ever. Yeah. But then it comes a time when it doesn't make you feel on top of the world. Yeah. 
it makes everything fucking 10 times worse, mate. Mm. And it brings you to the rock bottom and you do hit rock bottom on it. What were you doing on nights out to get banged up, to get nicked, to cause problems? What were you looking for? I wasn't looking to get nicked or I wasn't looking to get arrested or anything. Were you looking for fights though? You're looking yeah. for a bit of egg? Yeah. I'd actually go out, believe it or not, knowing that I was going to get into a scrap. Yeah. I'd know I was. Um, looking back now, I think what a fucking idiot. Because yeah. I'm in a different headspace. But when you're, when that's all you know is fighting and that feeling of adrenaline, so you're ch- it's like you're chasing a drug, isn't it? Yeah. Adrenaline. I mean, so for example, if you're out, you want to fight in a kebab shop, you want to have a fight on a, on a night in a boozer, someone's staring at you funnily or someone's bumped into you. Mm. You got that was your trigger moment, go, right, let's have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But mum said to me one day, why don't you go and throw yourself at airplanes? That's adrenaline. I said, because I don't fucking like heights, do I? <laughs> but, I but I went in the Paris. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you that earlier, in fact, thinking, fucking hold on a minute, you've gone in the Paris, you don't like heights. What was that first jump like? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> yeah, horrible, mate. You dealt so, with fear. At the, that's probably the biggest fear you'd have at that age. But what I do will say to people as well is one thing I found, and I didn't realise that at the time is, mm. uh, but in this new, in this new life, if you like, and I, you know, where I study behaviours and like more my behaviours than other people's, so I study myself more, you know, to learn my triggers and things. Mm. Is there's no growth inside your comfort zone? Yeah. It's only when you step outside your comfort yeah. zone do you find who you really are yeah. and there's growth in yourself. I mean, we, we have to do things sometimes that we don't like, mm. like going to counselling and hearing things, you know, going to the counsellor and hearing things that I didn't like is essentially stepping outside my comfort zone. When you heard stuff that you didn't like about you, how would you react? Oh, I'd get the ump. Yeah. Yeah, I'd get the ump big time. Um, i try and walk out. And um, I'd usually go to counselling with like my mum or, or someone. Um, yeah, and they'd be like, fucking sit back down and, you know, but what your mum's, what your mum says goes, doesn't it? And, yeah. Um, Is there any one person who can control you when you're at the height of your craziness? My mum. Your mum. A few times, um, I've been having a scrap. Um, so there's one time I come back from Afghan 2011. We just had this like massive firefight and we had, um, we had some detainees and me and a mate of mine had to take them up to Kabul. So we flew them up to Kabul where to you know, drop them off the detainees. And they basically said like, um, cause you're up in Kabul, you might as well go back on your two weeks off. So like, ah, fucking mega. So we um, went on my two weeks off. So less than 24 hours ago, I was having a scrap with the Taliban and dropping these detainees off. And then I was back home on the piss. And um, by 11 o'clock I was pissed. Um, so my mate's taking me to a taxi. And I bumped into this lad and knocked some chips out of his hand and he punched me on the nose and pop my nose and I just went into kill mode just wanted to fucking eat him um, so I just lost my shit mate big time and the police came over and said calm down so I chinned the copper um, and then everyone came over and I picked him up by a stab proof and threw him over a car bonnet and everyone was like fucking hell he's lost it so they phoned my mum and mum stood up and said David as soon as I heard my mum's voice David that's it bang stood to attention mate <laughs> 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 it's the mum's voice isn't it <laughs> um <laughs> And then I just got fucking jumped by all these coppers and they pepper sprayed me and my mum at the same time. Um, poor woman. But, Did they yeah. give you a beating? Oh, yeah. They like, put me in hospital, yeah. They, yeah. Had, they had to drop me off at hospital before I went to the police station. Yeah. Um, That's the worst thing you can do is chin a copper, isn't it? But the only reason I got away with it is because yeah. of what happened because I was fighting the Taliban less than 24 hours before. Yeah, okay. Um, and that was your, not excuse, but that was your... Yeah. yeah okay. I got like a um, community service, fine, um, I had to pay like a policeman compensation that, but I'm actually friends with a policeman. I chin now. Um, I'm actually friends with quite a few policemen around the area. I'd love to get that copper on you chinned. <laughs> get him on the podcast. <laughs> love to hear his version. Jesus. But he, um, <laughs> look, at, I've had some bad policemen look after me. Obviously, like when I've lost my mind and got myself in trouble, had a fight, got back home, they come to the house and arrested me. Um, I've had some bad policemen that wind you up even more. Yeah. But I've had some coppers that when they've seen me in a bad place, I mean, they obviously come to the house sometimes for welfare checks as well. Um, when I lose my mind or whatever and no one can get through to me, who are they going to call? The policeman. So the police come and try and deal with me. Because the last thing mum and dad want is me doing something stupid. Yeah. And I've had a policeman sit in the back of the car with me before. Not in the back where you know you get locked up in the mm. doors, but back of the car. And he cuddled me all the way to the fucking uh, hospital, mate. Wow. Literally cuddled me all the way to the hospital and said, look, we get you the help you need. 
like we'll stay with you all night and they stay with me in the hospital all night these two coppers so you know although they get a bad press of some fucking good coppers out there yeah there are and they're just doing their job yeah to help yeah I've got a lot of respect for mm. for a lot of them apart from those two <laughs> <laughs> well essentially they just went Dave calm down Come chin <laughs> how many times have you been arrested fucking loads mate go on roughly oh. Over a hundred, got to be. Over a hundred, probably. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, the, like the policemen know me around my way. Yeah, I bet they do. Um, funny story, actually. So I used to play rugby for the fire service as well. Not a fireman. Yeah, they just got me playing for them, and um, we played Thames Valley Police. <laughs> Fucking hell, they got their own back on me. <laughs> <laughs> One of them stuck his fingers up my nose. Yeah. We're, in a, we're in a ruck, and he stuck his fingers up my nose and pulled me towards him, but he split the inside of my nose with his I nail. See. I was like, you bastard. <laughs> and then every time he got the ball, I went for him and he just went, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Right away. laughs> what was the what was your movement after you went to commit suicide? You then months later you stabbing yourself. Has that all stopped? <laughs> it has all stopped. Yeah. What made that all stop? Believe it or not, ayahuasca. Yeah. Psychedelic. Psychedelics. I was gonna ask, I was gonna ask whether you've mm. tried it. What are your thoughts? Fucking out of this world. Did you enjoy the mindset from it? Do you want to hear the stories about yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Just explain to the listener that ayahuasca is. So it's a, it's a plant medicine. They call it the toad. It's a plant medicine, like ancient plant medicine from the jungle down in South America. Yep. It's basically like vines and leaves cooked together and then you drink the, the, the juice that's left behind. It tastes fucking horrible. Mm. Um, but you essentially ask it for something. And what you ask it for, it gives you, believe it or not. Um, if you go in to take it and you're in a bad headspace, then you're going to get a bad trip and it's not going to be good. Or if you ask it for something bad, then you need to prepare yourself for a bad trip. But what I will say is don't do psychedelics in an uncontrolled environment. You need to have somebody watching you that's fucking sober. Yeah. Um, I went and did it down in Costa Rica with people from the jungle. Um, uh, so I sat in the back of Molaca, you know, like the, the, the old big things with yeah. a, with a um, uh, straw top. Uh, we had a mattress with a bucket next to us for purging. Now, purging is uh, basically you get all the bad stuff out of you. So anything like yawning, crying, being sick, it's looked at getting all the bad out of yeah. you. Um, and one one time I was sick, I remember fucking sick like it. I thought I was going to turn inside out, mate. Mm. I was being that that bad. Um, but they cleanse your body. So you go down to Co uh, Costa Rica, do it with these people uh, from Soltara Healing Center, um, and then they cleanse your body for three days. And then you go into the ceremonies. The first one, I just got my head down, fell asleep, mate. Didn't feel nothing. I woke up and everyone had gone. I thought, fucking that shit. Mm. I didn't feel nothing. The second time, um, I told them I didn't feel nothing. The second time, they give me um, a bigger dose. And then I could see all these fucking shapes, mate. I was like, look at all these shapes. And went to the toilet. I was sick. And as I was coming back from the toilet, I just started going into this fucking realm. And it was like, the walls turned into castle walls. And it was like, Fucking hell, and I just started wandering off into the jungle and then they had to come and get me and put me back in my pocket. Did you enjoy it or did you start getting the fear? No, I was you were, I was all right with it. Happy with it, okay. Then I sat back down and I just led in my bed space and I was like, fucking hell, what's going on? Trying to work it all out. And then I see Kev, my mate, who died in Afghan, stood there holding a the baby, mate. And I was like, fucking hell. Like, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, fucking hell. Like, come on, I've got something to show you. And he put the kid in the room. Now I go back on the kid in a minute. He put the kid in the room. And he he went into this like massive hall, mate. And there's all my mates that have died, and Taliban soldiers on the piss. And I was like, I'm in Valhalla, because we all believe that we go. I got the Valhalla tattoo, like Valhalla admit one down here. Yeah. Um, I got the scene there. Look inside a skull. That's yeah. the reason I got it. Yeah. Um. So then I got the clarification then of they're in a good place. I also got. When, when your mates die in Afghan, sometimes in a horrific ways, you never get to say goodbye to them. Yeah. You never get. To... One thing I've always said now is women always say to their friends, I love you. They always show more emotion than men. Why? Why can't men show more like, like that same emotion? That's one thing I regretted is I never got to say goodbye to my mates. I never got to tell them I love them. I appreciate everything they've done for me. I never got to do that. Mm. But here, it gave me an opportunity to do that. I had one last beer with him. I went round him and said, 
love you. Appreciate everything you've done for me. Give him a cuddle and say goodbye to him. And then this Taliban fighter, the one that was now down in the road, come over to me and cuddled me and said, no hard feelings. And I just come out of that trip and I was like, fucking hell. Wow. What was that about? Mm. And um, they said, are you all right? I went, yeah, I'm just trying to process all that. And the next day you go back, you go to sleep. I didn't really sleep that night. I was just trying to work it all out. And um, I was messaging my mum saying, I've just fucking seen Kev. I've just seen the boys. Like, and she was like fucking blown away by it and just try and work it all out. And then the next day they coach you through what you see and why you see it. So I got a lot of, um, got a lot from that. The next time I did it, I said, show me what, before I took it, I said, show me what I need to see to live a positive life. And I went and sat down. I didn't feel anything. So one of the healers come past. I went, Todd, I said, I don't feel nothing. What do we do now? He goes, we do more. So he brought me another shot. <laughs> I did a shot and um, sat there for 10 minutes. Didn't feel anything. I said, Todd, I don't feel anything. He goes, seriously? I went, nah. He goes, he said, stay here. I'll get another one. So give me another one, mate. Fuck me. Like, probably seconds later, I just went into this fucking... It was just everything was on fire, mate. And I stood there in my pants and it was to the point where I was breathing and I could actually feel the heat in my inside me. You know when you're like in a hot air mm. and you breathe it, you can actually feel it in your mm. nose and your mouth. And I could feel this hot air and I was like, fucking, what's this place? And I was in my pants. And I was looking around and there's a smoky shadow in front of me with like a face. And he just walked away from me. He looked at me and just walked away. So I followed it and was like, show me what I need to see to live a positive life. He just kept looking back at me and fucking me off. So I kept following it. And I went through these big gates. And I was like, I'm in fucking hell. And this is a devil. And um, when I realized it was a devil, it, it, it kicked me out of the trip. And I was back in the this life, if you like. Um, and I looked at my hands and they were covered in blood. And when I see him covered in blood, it put me back into the trip again, which is fucking strange. But when it put me back in the trip, my wife and kids were dead at my feet. And I was trying to revive them. I screamed at the devil, like, help me. And he stood there laughing at me. And um, yeah, and in that trip, at the end of the trip, I killed myself. And that's when it put me out of the trip. It traumatized me, that one. Um, and they were trying to calm me down. I was like, I need to phone my fucking missus. They were like, no, don't phone her yet. Like, fucking just wait until tomorrow. And I was in a real bad place. Mm. Um, and Ollie, Ollie Ollerton, who I went out there with to do it, Oh, did Ollie um, go out there with you, did he? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, he was like, just fucking chill out. Like, he was trying to calm me down and so I was sharing a room with him out there. Um, and then the next day when they coached me through it, I started seeing what it had done for me. So being stood there in my pants in, in this fire um, stripped me back down to my bare self, stripped me of everything that I own. And it's just my bare self. And then it, sh it like losing my wife and kids in that trip showed me if, it, if, I, if I keep living a self-destructive life, that's what it's going to feel like. Yeah. They're going to walk away from me and leave me and they're, they're as good as dead if they walk away from me and have nothing to do with me. That's what it feels like to lose them. But also killing myself at the end of that trip was the death of my mind-based identity. Now, my mind-based identity being Military Dave, you're no longer a paratrooper. Leave that fucking life behind. You're a civvy now. You're a dad. You're a husband. Yeah. Get your fucking shit together. Yeah. That's who you are now. Game changer. And that's what my tri that trip done. <laughs> then the next time I done the trip, um, I took some shots and it it put me back into the fucking <laughs> into hell. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, not this again. <laughs> back again. <laughs> I was like, fuck. Yeah. What else you got to show yeah. me? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I actually said to the devil, "You don't control my mind. I do. Mm. You don't control me." Um, and it spat me out the trip. Um, and I thought that was it. Um, and I just kind of chilled out for a little bit. And then I laid back down just to wait to see everyone else had done their trip. And I went back into a trip again and my wife was sitting in front of me and um, we just stood in like fields and she held her hand out and said, come with me. We're going to go back to every situation you've been in the military and revisit it together. So we went back to every person I killed, every time I said a mate die. And we went back to every situation and we she done it with me in that trip. Oh, uh, so your wife did it with you? Yeah, and it just showed me that I have got a support network. Amazing. I need mate. to lean on people sometimes. Yeah. I don't I don't need to just do it on myself, be yeah. by myself all the time. Yeah. Sometimes talk and ask for help. Do you feel in a good place today? Yeah. 
Yeah. A stronger than ever before now, mate. Yeah. And that's kind of what adversity does to us, doesn't it? It mm. makes us stronger. Every hardship we go through teaches us lessons in life. I don't regret, you know, I don't regret one thing I've done because it's part of who I am. And I'm, you know, today I can actually say I'm proud of myself and who I am today. And every experience I've experienced in my life, good and bad, is a part of me. Um, and the bad times and the good times, I suppose. I've learned so much about life. And yeah. Isn't that what life's about? Yeah. So you can pass it on to your kids about your, your experiences. And I guess that's... Don't want to ever leave your kids behind, mate. No, no. No, and I have such a good relationship with my kids now. Yeah. They're everything to me. Um, obviously, I've left the security industry away now. You know, I'm, I'm no, no longer carrying weapons and running around with military kit on. I still have a lot to do with military. Um, I've got a passion for military art. Um, nice. So I've, I've started buying military art, go to art galleries and things. Cool and, yeah. My mate's like, where the fuck is that guy? <laughs> Where's our mate Dave Where's gone? our Dave gone? <laughs> <laughs> this is David. <laughs> <laughs> we actually say like, where the fuck's this guy gone? <laughs> Quality, mate. Um, so I've just changed my life around massively and they find it hard to believe. They, they, don't get me wrong, they love it. They they, they love me like seeing, you know, seeing with my kids and showing that love towards my kids and the amount of time I spend with them and you know what we get up to, they love that. Um, but they do say, like, where the fuck's our mate gone? Yeah. Right. Maybe they don't need to see him again. No, no. If you're out on a night out now and someone bumps into you, how do you react? Doesn't bother me. After the bar of a pint. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of people that didn't like me years ago have now come up to us and gone, you used to be a fucking prick. Yeah. But you're a good guy. Like, yeah. And I get along with a lot of people in the area now. Um, they've said, everyone's seen a massive change in me. Yeah. Huge change. Good for you, Dave. Um, <clears throat> I'm all about helping people now. Like there's people I employ around my area now. So we obviously got the um, the Reg our engineering group, the company where we employ veterans on the railway, um, putting people, you know, putting getting veterans back on the map, trying to find them a home as such. Yeah. When I was lost and didn't feel like there was a home for me, I was just bouncing around jobs all the time. This is about giving them a home and a place to mm. to feel at home, and work, and another brotherhood. Yeah. Um, it's like another army, like on the railway. Yeah. Orange army. Do you know there's a website out there? I know before you were probably looking around, where do I find something to tell me about what I'm going through? There's a website out there called Jack, J-A-A-Q dot org. Just ask a question dot org. And it's the coolest website going. Yeah. And it's got the coolest people on there. And they tell you everything you need to know about mental health, mind health. Yeah. It's unbelievable. That's awesome. Yeah. I just had Danny Gray on the episode, on the podcast today whose business it is yeah. and keep an eye on it it's, it's, it's something definitely go and check it anyone out there have any mind issues mm. of mind health go and check out jack.org yeah Dave this has been a fascinating fascinating conversation yeah really has it's a um, bit emotional sometimes yeah like it's more emotional when I talk about family nowadays yeah well just just one thing I was just going to before we finish up here have you got anything last words to say to your mum and dad yeah probably Sorry for everything I put them through, really. I put a lot of strain on my dad's relationship. Yeah. My little sister actually said to me, like, years ago, do you remember when mum and dad used to go out drinking all the time? And you could smell, like, the perfume in the air and, like, dad's old spice or brute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they used to go out. And I said, yeah. And they said they stopped a lot when you joined the army because they're so worried about you. And you put so much strain on their relationship. But because I was off having fun and doing what I wanted to do and being quite selfish in some respects, I didn't really stop and think for a minute that the stress I was putting my family through. So, yeah, yeah sorry for all that shit. Yeah, got a massive, massive. But thank shit, you yeah. also for supporting me. Yeah, absolutely. Me so I was just much. about to say they've mm. been there for you the whole time. Yeah, amazing. And your wife and two and lovely essentially, kids. Essentially, without without my dad, I wouldn't be here now. Yeah, yeah. What are their names? Steve and Sarah. Happy days. Big shout out to Steve and Sarah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Radders, I've loved this, mate. I didn't know where this was going to go, and you have certainly lived an eventful life. I wish you all the peace Thank moving you, forwards, mate. mate. Thank you. Yeah, but thanks for having me, mate. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been um, been really good. Wicked. You're a gentleman, man. Thank you, mate. Good man. Nice one, matters. <laughs> Take care, mate. You, Cheers. Mate. Cheers. Cheers.